На солнечном пляже в июне В своих голубых пижама Девчонка, звезда и шалунья Она меня сводит с ума The cold sea wind seemed to blow through the apartment. Mishka Yapanchik, the king of Odessa thieves, was reading a letter from a beautiful lady. She was begging him for help. The actress had never used her fans for personal gain, but on this occasion the situation was a hopeless one. The woman desperately needed to get to Moscow. Her relatives were being held hostage there by the Bolsheviks. Only representatives of the criminal world could help her leave Odessa, which was under the white guard at the time. Vera Holodna was a star of silent movies, the queen of the screen who won the hearts of millions. She was the manifestation of the ideal image of female beauty at that time. The whole life of this Ukrainian woman from Poltava was in plain view. She was imitated and envied, loved and hated. But the death of the young cinema legend is still a mystery. These 48 seconds caused panic in many people at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. The arrival of a train is the first silent short film. It was made by the French, the Lumiere brothers, at La Ciotat station in 1895. After seeing the film, Russian writer Maxim Gorky wrote, Suddenly something clicks, everything goes dark, and a railway train appears on the screen. Beware, it's coming at you like an arrow. It seems as if it's about to plunge into the darkness where you sat. And so began the era of cinema. But no one could imagine at the start of the 20th century that 20 years later the Russian Empire alone would produce up to 500 films a year, and Ukrainian Vera Levchenko, married name Holodna, would become a film star. Vera was born in Poltava on August 5, 1893. Her father Vasil Andreevich Levchenko graduated from the Verbal Sciences Department of Moscow University, and her mother Katerina Serhivna graduated from the Mariinsky Institute for Noble Maidens. The girl's grandmother Katerina Volodymyrovna took it upon herself to bring her up. Vera was a quiet, obedient child when she was growing up. She learned to read early and searched for books about sea adventures, pirates and robbers, man-eaters and brave sailors. At the age of 10, the girl fell in love with ballet. Moscow, Russia the Bolshoi Theater, marvelous architecture and a deep history. A ballet school operated at the theater at the beginning of the 20th century. Its best students had the chance to join the troupe of the Bolshoi Theater. Vera won the very tough selection to enroll in the school. She was regarded as a promising student. It seemed as though all the paths to the stage were open for the girl. It was only her grandmother who continued to resist. She considered ballet a frivolous and immoral affair. So the girl had to quit her favorite hobby. Even the arguments of a distant relative, famous actress Olena Leshkovska, did not help. But creativity raged in her young soul. Vera played in Without a Dowry by Alexander Ostrovsky in a gymnasium performance. After this success, the girl was inspired by the theater. Vera saw the play Francesca da Rimini by Gabriele D'Annunzio. The empress of the Russian dramatic theater Vera Komersarzevska played the lead role. Vera was literally suffocating from the impressions that overwhelmed her. She became withdrawn when she returned home from the theater. She became feverish at night, and the fever stayed with her for a whole week. The family doctor explained to her parents that their daughter was too impressionable and prone to sadness. Too much reading and dreaming was bad for her. At her prom night, the gymnasium student met law student Volodymyr Holodny. He took her to a distant corner and started reciting poems by his favorite poet Nikolai Gumilov.
car racing was a popular and exotic form of entertainment at the turn of the century. Rapid development of science and technology attracted even more people who liked such extreme thrills. Vita's future husband was also among the drivers of the early 20th century. After graduating from the gymnasium, Volodymyr asked her out for a date. They were to meet at the racing circuit, but he didn't come at the appointed time. Vita was about to leave as a racing car pulled out. Holodny was behind the wheel. Even the disapproval of relatives didn't prevent them from having a quick wedding. In 1912, the couple had a daughter, Yevhenia. They wanted more children, but doctors advised them not to. A year later, the family adopted another girl, Nona. Maria Yermolova, Ivan Moskvin, Alisa Konen, Sarah Bernard. Yes, there were strong actors to see on the stages of Moscow theaters in 1910. Vera made her husband go to see a play with her almost every evening, but most of the time they went to the buff cinema. Cinema fans were mesmerized by movies with Danish actress Asta Nilsson. Critics consider her the first serious cinematic actress. She did not wring her hands, roll her eyes or make faces, like many others did. She just remained natural. Vera Holodna idolized Asta Nilsson and went to see all her films. It's possible that the desire to be just like her idol led Vera to the Taldikin and Co. Cinema Factory. Unfortunately, things did not get past audition. First World War. Vera's spouse left for the front. He was worshipped by women and respected by men. The idol of pre-October Russia, poet, composer, actor and singer Alexander Vertinsky. He eventually left his homeland after the death of Vera. In the meantime, millions of music lovers and especially the muse listened to his silver voice. A soldier came to visit Vera one day. He brought her a letter from her husband from the front. That's how Holodna and Vertinsky met. They were bound by friendship and a passionate love for art. They once performed in a Moscow hospital. The people were puzzled. They did not know what numbers an inconspicuous soldier and a gorgeous beauty could perform. And then they suddenly started dancing the tango. It seemed like unrequited love, mutual admiration and sadness were all expressed in this hot dance. Vertinsky later recalled something he regretted the rest of his life. I once came to her with my new song. It was called Your Fingers Smell of Incense. I'd already sent it to a publishing house and as always I dedicated it to Holodna. She started waving her hands at me as I read her the lyrics. What have you done? Stop it! I don't want to lie in a casket. Never! She was strangely flustered. This is death. Take back the dedication right now. I remember I was even a little upset. Despite the First World War, film studios appeared in Moscow and St. Petersburg like mushrooms after rain. They established rapid production of sappy love stories. There were often ads on studio doors that invited people to be filmed for money. Vera needed money, so she decided to audition for a movie. Director Vladimir Gardin was working on a film adaptation of Leo Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina. Vera went to the Timon and Reinhardt workshop. He took her on as one of the extras who played guests at the ball. But after a day of shooting, the aspiring actress said, I got three rubles for today, but I am not at all happy with that. I want a role. Give me an opportunity to see myself not just in the mirror. The director agreed to her request. She was an attractive woman, so why not adorn one's film with a pretty face? Slender, flexible, a former dancer, she sat in front of me, with her beautiful eyelashes underlining her fascinating eyes, and said that she wanted to try her hand at being a movie actress. Vera got a tiny role of wet nurse for Anna Karenina's son, but the director's conclusion after filming was unambiguous – she won't make a good actress. 
Vera Holodna can only turn her beautiful head and raise her eyes to the left and to the right, even though she does that really well. But beautiful Vera can do nothing else. To get rid of the annoying women, Garden sent Vera to Yevgeny Bauer, director of the company Hanjon Kavenko. He was about to start filming the mystical love drama The Song of Triumph and Love, based on a short story by Turgenev. The main role required a woman of extraordinary beauty. Experience and ability to act were not important. Holodna's beauty made a strong impression on the film crew. The movie was a resounding success, and the role made the actress famous. She immediately became known as a queen of the screen, director Ivan Peristiani wrote. The face of the relatively young Vera Holodna had an imprint of sadness inherent to our northern nature in days of early autumn. It's possible that it was this passive tenderness of her figure, eyes, and movements that helped viewers connect with her. Holodna's first movie was not even released yet when director Bauer started filming the next one. In a year, Vera starred in 13 films. Fierce competition in the industry required such a rapid pace. The studio, which was one of the largest in Europe, made film after film to not go bankrupt. Here's how American film critic Jay Leda described Holodna's debut. The greatest actress of pre-revolutionary cinema appeared and flourished in the early spring of 1915. Vera Holodna, wife of a modest officer, got a job as an extra at a film studio. She had just one evening dress in her wardrobe, which she skillfully decorated with a flower by pinning it either to her shoulder or waist. This black dress and her jet black hair framed her pale face, covered in deathly pale makeup, so making her huge bottle green eyes stand out even in a crowd of extras. At the top of her fame, Vera Holodna said, My eyes are my bread. Vera became popular in such a short time. As people said back then, they were going to see Holodna. Viewers got immersed in stories on the screen together with her characters. In Kharkiv, crowds at the cinema were so large that all the windows were broken, doors were torn off their hinges, and a detachment of horse dragoons was called to calm the crowd that had attacked the hall. Similar things were taking place all over the country. It was thanks to Vera Holodna that people had inadvertently discovered cinema. According to various sources, the actress starred in 40 to 80 films by 1918. Film critics said she was a movie star of a European level. The woman convincingly portrayed seductresses while remaining a faithful wife in real life. Vita once rejected a famous admirer, the Odessa magnate Solodovnikov, on a film set. The latter tried to buy her outright for himself. The film director begged the actress to meet the millionaire again, as that would have contributed to the development of the film business. In response, she walked off the set and halted filming. Her beauty amazed both men and women. She designed her own dresses, chose fabrics and finishes, and decorated her own hats. Postcards with pictures of her had huge print runs. On these postcards, Vera Holodna was depicted in furs, gypsy clothes, men's clothes, and open evening dresses. Sudden news came from the front that her husband was seriously wounded. Vera went quickly to Warsaw from the film set. She spent two weeks at Volodymyr's bedside. The director found a replacement for her in those two weeks, but the studio owner ordered her to return to the set. After the injury, her husband suffered from frequent headaches. He began stuttering. He had to forget about his career as a lawyer. Volodymyr tried to start his own business. Vera borrowed money from the studio owner for that, but the business went bankrupt. She had to return the debt by starring in two films at the same time. Films with Holodna were released every three weeks and were wildly successful. Lively, sociable, direct, 
She danced tirelessly, played tennis, skated, went for a spin in the car with her husband. She was a caring daughter and sister, a loving wife and mother, but she transformed herself every time she was in front of a film camera or photo camera. On numerous studio photos, she is a trendsetter, a gorgeous woman in expensive fashionable clothes, sophisticated hats, light tunics, heavily flowing silks. But in everyday life, her style was simple and tasteful, not striking. She preferred to wear black clothes. Other actresses considered Vera conceited and talentless and schemed against her. But the fact that Holodna remained in demand and popular after the 1917 October Revolution in Russia was proof of the durability of her talent. Here's what she said in an interview with Moscow's Kino Gazeta. Foreign companies are offering us big money, which means that they value us highly there. But it would be a painful crime to part with my motherland, even if it is exhausted and ravaged. I will not do that. Production of the next movie required location shooting. They were traditionally done in Odessa, but the country was enveloped in the flames of civil war. Vera had no interest in the conflict between the Bolsheviks and the White Army. She was just glad that she was going to the sea with her family. But then she was summoned to the Kremlin. She was given an anonymous letter. It stated, We have become aware that you and your husband are going to escape abroad from Odessa port. To dispel the suspicion, Volodymyr, daughter Nona, and the actress's grandmother remained in Bolshevik-run Moscow as unofficial hostages. Vera went back to her homeland, to Ukraine. But when it came time to return to Moscow after filming, the situation on the fronts had changed. Odessa was in chaos at the time. Power was changing hands all the time. The Bolsheviks, the Germans, the Hetmans, the Whites, the French. This political kaleidoscope was taking place against the backdrop of lawlessness, led by Mishka Yaponchik, the uncrowned king of the criminal underground. As of mid-January 1919, power in the city ended up in the hands of the chief of staff of the French army, Henri Freidenberg. The film crew had permission from the Bolsheviks to travel to Moscow. Just one thing remained – crossing the territory occupied by white troops. Only Henri Freidenberg, representative of the allies of the White Guard, could issue such a document. The Frenchman knew just how much Holodna was dependent on his will. The officer tried to hit on the actress. Even the local newspaper Vichirni Chas wrote about this. A charming queen of the screen, this beautiful seductress who hypnotized a man who possesses strength and power. However, Vera rejected all the Frydenberg's advances in anger. It obviously seemed impossible to leave Odessa and return to her family after that. In desperation, Vera reached out to representatives of the criminal underworld. Mishka Yaponchik was not personally acquainted with the famous actress, although, according to rumors, he was a big fan of the talent of the silent film star. The escape plan was almost ready. On a February evening, Vera was given to attend charity concert in a theater. After that, she had an appointment with Mishka Yaponchik. They decided to discuss the final preparations. During the intermission, Holodna entered her dressing room. There was a large bouquet of lilies on the table. The actress inhaled the mesmerizing smell. But then she noticed a note with the name of Henri Freidenberg, whom she'd rejected. Vera was found unconscious. Holodna died a week after that. Newspapers wrote that the actress died from Spanish flu. But what really killed one of the greatest cinema actresses flu or flowers sprayed with poison? Autopsies were not performed back then. The queen of the screen took the answers to the other world. When Volodymyr found out about his wife's death, he locked himself in his office and didn't come out for several days. Vera's daughter recalls how he talked to the portrait of his beloved, asking her for forgiveness. In our apartment in Moscow, chekists ripped through walls, pillows, mattresses and furniture with bayonets, then took it all away. They didn't touch my great-grandmother or my sister Nona. They brought presents for father to prison until they were told they no longer needed to do so. Dad was executed at the end of 1919. Vera Holodna is a whole era in cinematography that lasted just four years. The actress played the same role in almost all of her movies, a suffering woman, a victim of passion. She best described her creative method herself. 
You can't just be a monkey that does what the director says. You need to be different in every role. My dream is to play tragic roles like Marguerite Gauthier. You know, acting in movies takes a lot of effort and it's so tiring, but I love doing it. Most of the movies with Holodna have not been preserved. However, books are still being written about her, movies are still being filmed. Her image stirs the imagination of artists. Alexandra Vertinsky performed in Rostov and Don in February 1919. A telegram from Odessa was brought to his room, which stated, Vera Holodna has died. Could it be that the words he dedicated to her, his muse, turned out to be fatal? <laughs> Ничего теперь не надо нам, никого теперь не жаль. The future of cinema is grand and immense, and I am happy if my shadows on the screen bring people at least a little bit of joy.